If you're taking notes, um, the title of my message is Dawn is Coming, Crisis, Confusion, and Christ. We'll be opening um, Exodus 5, starting there, going into 7. If you guys can bow your heads and we'll pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you um, just for bringing all these women here, Lord, tonight. Um, I thank you that you got them here safely. I pray for those who are not able to make it tonight, Lord. I pray that you would just meet them where they're at, um, that you would fall afresh on them, Lord, in their um, households or wherever they may be. I pray that you would just um, go before us now in this time as we study your word and we dissect um, these chapters of scripture. I pray that you would empty me of me, that you would fill me with your spirit, Lord, that your words would go out and it would minister to all of our hearts, Lord. So we give this time to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, a little bit about me. Um, my name is Savannah, for those of you who don't know me or who are newer to Radiance. Um, I have been a part of Radiance now for eight years. Um, this is my third year teaching. Um, I have four little children, um, five, including the one in heaven. His name is Levi, and his birthday is on the 22nd of this month. Um, he will be 11 on the 22nd. My daughter, Penelope, will be or she just turned 10 in September. Um, my next one, Kennedy, will be nine in December. My next one, Swayze, she'll, uh, she just turned, we had like three birthdays in a row, she just turned seven. And then my youngest, my baby, his name is Nash, um, he just turned six. So I have six, seven, nine, almost, and 10. Um, so I'm pretty busy. Um, I homeschool, it's a hectic schedule, but it's sweet and I enjoy it and I'm thankful for it. Um, I enjoy working out. I try to go five times a week. I, I find that time to do it um, early and I like to go early and when I'm feeling extra crazy, I go at 5 a.m. instead of 6 a.m. Um, so, you know, preferably I like to do it then because then I can come home and start my day and feel better that I'm like, okay, we could do this now. So it wakes me up um, and then I come home ready to handle all the household duties and being a wife, mom, teacher, all of that. Um, when I go at 5 a.m., it's completely black outside. Um, I live in Oak Hills, and I go towards, like, Apple Valley, Victorville area. So I drive a little bit, and it's just dark, um, super, super dark. We lived in Spring Valley for a while, now we're in Oak Hills, and it's completely different. For those of you who live in Oak Hills, it's very dark, not the same, but it's fine. Um, we're surviving, <laughs> we're making it. Uh, but going back out that way, you know, I'm on Hesperia Road and it's like a two lane highway street and um, it's just completely black. It's very, very dark. There is no sun on the west side uh, going down. There's no sun on the east side rising. And then in minutes, it just seems like that changes. One minute it's dark and the next the sun rises. The sun starts to peek over the horizon and before I get home, it's bright outside. Like there is no darkness anywhere. That's usually when I sit and I open up my window and I just read my uh, devotions and I drink my coffee and I kind of welcome the children as they start waking up. Um, but outside it's completely dark and then in seconds it's bright. There's not a speck of darkness. Because the thing is, it's always darkest before dawn. Chapter five opens with obedience, but the demand is met with rebellion. It's about to get darker before it gets brighter. It's a crisis Moses should have expected, but in his humanity, his heart grew weary. The darkness makes its way, but dawn is coming. We can take that to the bank and cash it. Moses listened to God and went to Pharaoh. We see that in the opening of chapter five. With that request, the people's burden, though, got heavier. So Moses does what he is asked and then is blamed for Pharaoh's behavior and cruel commands. He sinks in anguish and his heart is troubled. Although he listened... We see that at the end of chapter 5, Moses turning to the Lord and questioning why he has done this to his people and why he was ever sent. Moses has a real talk moment with God at the end. He questions God on why he chose him to do this, and he even questions God's sovereignty as if the Lord will not remain faithful to his word. The Christian life can look a lot like this. We hear the call of the Lord, we surrender, we answer the call, we step out in faith, and then when the Lord doesn't work on our timing— when the darkness falls, when the crisis hits, we doubt, we question, our hearts are troubled, and we grow weary as if the promise of that sun rising is invalid. 
We are human and Moses was human. The sun will shine, it will rise, but not by anything we do alone. We're gonna look at three points tonight if you wanna write them down. Number one is crisis. Number two is confusion. And number three is Christ. In crisis, we're gonna see the rebellious heart. In confusion, we're gonna see the weary heart. And in Christ, we're gonna see the confident heart or the comforted heart. The crisis here in verse one to 20 is Moses goes to Pharaoh and does what the Lord asks, but the demand is met with rebellion. Let's pick up in verse one uh, down to three. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, thus says the Lord God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast for me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, who is this Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. So they said, the God of Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three days journey into the desert and sacrifice to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with the sword. Now, the obedience here can be debatable. Uh, There are two views that you kind of come across. One, uh, many believe that Moses did not fully listen while others suspect that he was speaking in such a way that Pharaoh, as a non-believer or unbeliever, would be able to understand. In chapter 3, verse 16 and 18, we see the Lord tell Moses, Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord God your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to me, saying, I have surely visited and seen what is done for you in Egypt. And then verse 18 says, You and the elders of Israel shall go to the king. So we don't see any mention of the elders, being with them in chapter five. Were they there, but quiet? Did they choose to stay back? Did Moses not ask them to come? We aren't specifically told. Um, Some scholars have raised the question about the precise wording of the request. We don't really know if this could have changed the way the outcome or changed how it went down in that encounter, but the outcome itself, the mass exodus, would still be the same. The Lord would do what he said he would do. We can say, you know, was this accurate? Did Moses do what God actually said from chapter three? Was Aaron the one who spoke the word since he was the mouthpiece? Did they disobey? Though that way of looking at it has some plausibility, it's possible that they were trying to reach Pharaoh by speaking to him in a way that he could understand. Philip Ryken says, there are many ways to handle this objection. One is to suggest that dictators like Pharaoh have no right to the truth. Another is to point out that Moses and Aaron never said anything about returning to Egypt. But perhaps the best answer is that God was giving Pharaoh a test. His ultimate plan was to lead Israel out of Egypt together. But he began by giving his rival a simple opportunity to submit to his divine authority. Was Pharaoh willing to let Israel serve God even for three days or not? They described God as the God of Hebrews when Pharaoh asks, who is the Lord? If Pharaoh did not listen, Moses says the consequences would be devastating, not only for Israel, but also for the Egyptians. We see ultimately this is what happens later. The Egyptians will be visited with 10 dreadful plagues. He had been warned. Verse four picks up and says, then the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people from their work? Get back to your labor. And Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are now many and you make them rest from their labor. So the same day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their officers saying, you shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks as you did before. Let them go and gather straw for themselves, and you shall lay on them a quota of bricks which they made before. You shall not reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry out, saying, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let more work be laid on them, that they may labor in it, and let them not regard and let them not regard false words. And the taskmasters of the people and their officers went out and spoke to the people, saying, Thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go get yourselves straw where you can find it, yet none of your work will be reduced. So the people were scattered abroad all throughout the land of Egypt to gather stubble instead of straw. And the taskmasters forced them to hurry, saying, fulfill your work, your daily quota, as there was when there was straw. Also, the officers of the children of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had sent over them, were beaten and were asked, why have you not fulfilled your task in making brick, both yesterday and today as before? So here we see the cruelty that comes in the crisis. Pharaoh basically says, since you have so much free time on your hands and you want to go worship the Lord for three days, you're just being lazy. 
So we're going to make your work even harder. Also, why would Pharaoh listen to a strange God? Why would he obey this God that he had nothing or knew nothing about? By doing so, he would be acknowledging that there is a deity higher than himself. Henry Forkfoot said the Egyptians believed in the person of Pharaoh as a superhuman being, taking charge of the affairs of man. Pharaoh claims to be, a div- uh, to be divine. His claim to be divine was evident in how he treated the Israelites, asserting the right over their work and their worship. He considered the Hebrews his slaves, his servants, by having dominion over them. Now, before we jump and point the finger, let's take a moment here and look at the nature of Pharaoh a bit closer. We see the rebellious heart in verse 2. Pharaoh says in verse 10, thus says Pharaoh, and by doing so, he put himself in the place of God. Isn't that what every non-believer does? They make themselves their own God. They do what they please. They deny that anyone has authority over them. They live their life the way they want to. The, uh, the unbeliever is ignorant of God's identity. They don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. They are usually arrogant and proud and resemble Pharaoh. However, Pharaoh's ignorance was also defiant. And he was about to be met with a heavy encounter. Isn't that what every unbeliever needs? They need, to, uh, they need that undeniable encounter with God to respectfully change their lives and place God on the throne of their lives. The arrogance turns to gratitude and the pride turns to meekness. The callous heart is softened. But let's take a moment here and examine our own hearts. It's easy to point the finger and say, well, Pharaoh was, you know, a a god to the Egyptians, so he didn't listen to God and because he didn't really know God, and so he didn't know right from wrong. Okay, but let's use this time to ask the Lord to reveal to us anything that is problematic. Ask for him to remove any rebellion that is in our hearts. Is there something in your life that God is asking you to do? Maybe he's bringing people into your life to bring it up to you. Maybe you have a Moses coming to you at the request of God and asking for change in your life and you continue to deny it and you continue to be the king of your own heart. This is a reflection moment. It's easy to look at Pharaoh and point the finger. But if we here say that we know God, we are to walk in light and truth. Yet if we disobey, it is sin. James 4, 17 says, Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him is sin. This is only a question you can answer. Ask the Lord to search you, to help you identify those sinful areas in your life so that you may be forgiven and have a renewed spirit. Psalm 129, 23 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Regardless of how badly you have rebelled, 1 John 1, 9 bring us, uh, brings us reassurance, and it says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. We may be a little bit more like Pharaoh than we would like to admit, but praise God that his mercies are new each morning. Just when things seemed like they were as bad as they could be, Pharaoh made it worse. They had to work even harder than before. They were facing impossible demands and getting beat for not meeting them. Straw was essential to the whole process because it reinforced the clay to help the bricks stay intact. It took millions of bricks to satisfy Pharaoh's builds. God's people were suffering. The Israelites were in bitter bondage. We know that persecution is part of the Christian life. It's always been there and it always will be. But Matthew 10, 22 even reassures that where it says, you will be hated by all men for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. The Bible carefully records every detail of their suffering to show us their desperate need of salvation and to reveal God, the glory of God's grace. The good news of salvation means freedom for captives. After God saved them, he said in verse 20, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. But verse 15 says, your servants. The Israelites are referring to themselves as belonging to Pharaoh. The people are in need here of uh, learning to reclaim the, the Lord as their God and trust that the Lord will work on their behalf. They are not only slaves to Pharaoh by default, but they also refer to them as his servants. We often become so blind and entangled in sin that we get so used to sinning that we scarcely recognize the bondage we're in. Sin is the ultimate taskmaster. Demanding more of us and giving less and less in return. 
We are all born into the captivity of sin, though. We are all slaves until Christ sets us free. The devil himself is taking us captive to do his will, says 2 Timothy 2.26. We are in bondage to sin apart from the saving work of Jesus Christ. We need someone like Moses to speak on our behalf, to bring us out of slavery from ourselves. We need a savior. We need the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 2.15 says, Jesus came to deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. And Revelation 1, 5b and 6 says, To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. The takeaway here is that the Lord has come to save and free, but Satan will not go down without a fight. Next, we're going to look at the confusion. Moses is trying here. He's trying. He's like, Lord, I've done what you've asked. It's not working. I don't know what you want me to do. And he's confused in this. And we've seen in the last two verses his weary heart. Uh, chapter or Verse 20 says, Then as they came from Pharaoh, they met Moses and Aaron who stood there to meet them. And they said, Let the Lord look on you and judge you because you have made us... Uh, you have made us abhorrent in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants to put a sword in their hand to kill us. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, why have you brought trouble on this people? Why is it you have sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to his people. Neither have you delivered your people at all. They uh, presented their anger against Moses. They were blaming their spiritual leader for their troubles. They were pronouncing even judgment to come down on God's appointed servant. Have you ever heard the expression, hurting people hurt people? <laughs> because that was them. Humanly speaking, it was Moses' fault. His plan completely backfired. He's like, I'm going to come to Pharaoh and save you guys, and this is going to be great. We're just going to walk right out of here. But to them, they're like, no, you didn't. You just made our work harder. And so now they're literally like, let the Lord judge you because you just messed up our life. The foreman failed to do what they should have. In the end of chapter 2, verse 23, we see the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out to God. God's people here did not go to him. They didn't ask Moses to hold a prayer meeting. They didn't go back to God, the only one who could truly save them. They just simply lashed out. Sure, maybe Moses could have expected this a little bit. In chapter 3, 19 and 4, 21, God tells Moses, he will not let you go. I don't know if he just didn't hear that part or if he just heard that the Lord's on the move and he's like, great, Lord, we're going to leave. But God literally tells Moses in that chapter in three and four, he will not let you go. So you're going to go and do it, but he's not going to let you go. There's no such thing, though, as an untested faith. Remember, just like Moses, we too are human and we don't always handle it right the first time. Some of us, not the second or the third time either. Our hearts do grow weary. We have doubts. We struggle to take heed of God's word. We want to take a step back and say, I can't do it, Lord. Send somebody else. We want things on our time frame. And honestly, we just want it to come easy sometimes. But we know that the Christian walk is not a walk in the park. We are instructed all throughout scripture to allow our trials to further our faith. James 1, 2 through 4 tells us, count it all joy when we endure various trials. And the end of 4 says, be patient. 1 Peter 4, 12 to 13 says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to you as though some strange thing has happened to you, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Job 23, 10, when he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. In contrast to the Israelite people, Moses knew to bring his failures to the Lord. We have to give him credit for this. In 522, it says, Moses returned to the Lord. Warren Wearsby said, God's chosen servant must expect opposition and misunderstanding because that's part of what it means to be a leader. And leaders must know how to get alone with God, pour out their heart, and seek his strength and wisdom. Even with a weary heart and the feeling of failure, he returns to the Lord. This cannot be overlooked because I think oftentimes it's, it's a difficult thing to do. Let Moses be our example in times of weariness or failure that we need to get ourselves promptly back to the Lord. This is not easily learned, but the sooner we learn, the better. Remember, he failed the first time. In, in uh, chapter 2, verse 15, it says he ran away. This time he has ran back to the Lord. I love this uh, song, and it's just been on in my house on repeat all week, but 
it goes like this, uh, the little chorus. It says, you will fight my battles if I will just be still. Why would I keep running when you're right here? I'll just be quiet and let you speak through the silence. Here I am, no more hiding. You are in this moment. I won't fight it. I'll just be quiet. And I can't help but think of times in my own life when running felt easier. The enemy is tactful. He lies to us by telling us, flee, go. You have no hope. You are a lost cause. But the Lord tells the weary to come to him, to lay it at his feet. And I have learned, and I pray that I continue to learn, if I desire God to speak to me, I must be silent and let him speak through that silence. When your heart is weary and beat down, what is your first instinct? Not only does this show the growth in the life of Moses, but it also reveals to us the character of God. He is long-suffering, he is forgiving, he is gracious, he never is hidden, and he is always ready to welcome us back with open arms. Isaiah 40, 31 says, But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Moses' obedience led to a crisis, and the crisis led to confusion, and the confusion now will be overcome by the Christ. In chapter 6, God renews his promise to Israel. Picking up in verse 1, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand, he will let them go. And with a strong hand, he will drive them out of his land. And God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I was not known to them. I have established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage in which they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel whom the Egyptians keep in bondage. And I have remembered my covenant. Verse six, therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. And with great judgments, I will take you as my people and I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you to a land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and I will give it to you as a heritage. I am the Lord. So Moses spoke thus to the children of Israel but they did not heed Moses because of anguish because of the anguish of their spirit and the cruel bondage. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, go in, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the children of Israel go out of his land. With a strong hand refers to what the Lord will do in order to bring Israel out of Egypt, not in the manner of which Pharaoh will send them out. The Hebrew verb, he will send them out, is translated, he will let you go. In verse three, God reveals another name. It's no longer just God Almighty, but Yahweh, a greater name, a bigger name. It embraces the old, but in addition to. He says, I built a covenant with the name God Almighty. As they had certain, as they had certainty then, Abraham, how much more should Moses be encouraged now? This brings us to a comforted heart. God wanted his people to understand that the Lord, uh, understand that the answer to all their problems was to be found in him. Perhaps this is why the Lord allowed Moses to fail the first time. If they would have been able to exit round one, maybe they would have given Moses credit. Genesis 4 says, men began to call on the name of the Lord, Yahweh. So they knew of the name, but they mostly heard El Shaddai, which means God Almighty, the name he used when he made that covenant with Abraham. And those of you who were with us last year when we studied Genesis, you may remember that. But now he says, I am introducing myself as I am. I am the Lord. God makes this statement more than a dozen times in the book of Exodus. In verse four, God said he made a covenant with the name God Almighty. And now he says, I have made myself known to you as Yahweh. God reaffirms his commitment to his people. We can walk confidently in him when he speaks because he speaks with authority and power. God states his name and God says he will accomplish his plan. He comforts our weary heart just by simply being I am. Could God snap his finger and just make things go the way he wants? Sure, he can. But it's not about that. It's about revealing himself in such a way that leaves no doubt that it is only by the work of the Lord. John Piper said, do not begrudge the work of the Lord, for these things are not easily learned. God allowed the Israelites to go through what they went through for a greater purpose, just like he does with you and I. 
Daniel 4, 35 says, The Most High does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stray his hand. If God purposes with all his heart to do a thing, it simply cannot be stopped by anything in this universe. Psalm 115, 3 says, Our God is in heaven, in the heavens. He does what he pleases. In Isaiah 46, 9 to 10, it says, God says, I am God and there is none like me saying, my, can- my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purposes. When we hit crisis and confusion in our own life, we can walk confidently and take comfort in the one who says, I am the Lord. Because here's the thing, the Lord did not tell Moses to cheer up buttercup, get a grip, you're gonna be fine, it's okay. It was nothing, it had nothing to do with Moses. It wasn't about Moses. Rather, the Lord renewed the revelation of himself. Moses pointed out that God didn't seem to be doing much of anything. Yet by the end of Exodus, Moses saw God do absolutely everything he said he would. We see a turning point from this encounter. God says, now you shall see what I will do. Yahweh is the first and last, the Alpha, the Omega. He has begun the work and he's going to complete it. So how does the Lord respond to us when we are beaten down and in despair? He doesn't say, just keep going, you're doing good, you're such a good person. No, he's, he gives us his promises. He gives us promises to comfort our heart because it's not about us. It's not about our situation. It's not about what we can do to help ourselves. It's literally his promises that carry us through. Just like he did here with Moses, verses one to eight, he reminds him four times. He says, I am the Lord. Seven times he says, I will. These are the promises from the Lord. It's about Christ and what he can do in and through us. We are simply the tools to accomplish his plan for his glory. Although there are seven, we will see in these verses that there are really only four basic promises of the I will statements. The first two I wills speak of liberation. He is promising to be their deliverer. The third I will promises redemption. Israel was redeemed with great acts of judgment and God himself was the redeemer releasing his people with an outstretched arm. The word take really means to adopt. So the fourth and fifth I will of salvation contains the promise of adoption. This pertains to the covenant God made with Abraham back in Genesis 17, where he says, I will be God to you and your offspring after you. The last two I wills concern what might be called uh, the promise of possession. He says, I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. God proves that he is Lord by saving his people. He uh, is liberating them, redeeming them, adopting them, and giving them the land to be their very own. All that's left for the Israelites to do is to know him as their Lord and Savior. Salvation is not about us doing something for Jesus. Rather, it's about what Jesus has done for us. In verse 9, it goes from God's I wills to Israel's I won'ts. Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, but they, said, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. They were not impressed with God's mighty power and his ability to renew his covenant. They refused to believe that he was the Savior and Lord. Their chains were preventing them from hearing the cry of freedom, and they were discouraged. Literally, their spirits were broken, it says, so broken that they couldn't even listen to the promises of deliverance that Moses was trying to bring to them. What kept them in bondage was their bondage itself. Uh, verse 12 says, And Moses spoke to the, uh, before the Lord, saying, The children of Israel have not heeded me. How then shall Pharaoh heed me? For I am an, of uncircumcised lips. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, and gave uh, them a command for the children of Israel and Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, to bring the children out of Israel, of the land, uh, out of Israel, out of the land of Egypt. If this sounds familiar, it's because it does, it should. It's because God had sent Moses to Pharaoh before. And Moses answers basically by saying, I don't have the gifts to do what God's calling me to do. And Moses was sent to Pharaoh to let God's people go. And in both cases, refused because he wasn't a gifted speaker. The phrase uncircumcised lips may mean that he had some sort of speech impediment. The first time Moses spoke to Israel, they believed him. But this time, they didn't even want to hear what he had to say. He had legit reasons for being like, I'm not up to the task, Lord. Uh, He had been rebuked by Pharaoh. He had been rejected by his own people. So why would this time be any different, he thinks. If he couldn't persuade his own people, how in the world is he going to persuade Pharaoh? 
And I just thought, like, are we ever tempted in that in those moments of where it's like, this is just hard, Lord. My nose is to the ground. Like, I'm just ready to give up. I can't do this. This isn't working. Has there been a time in your life or are you currently in a time when you've been tempted to stop doing something you know the Lord has called you to do? Have you given lame excuses like, I can't do it, I'm not qualified, I don't have the time, because God is not interested in our excuses. I've tried it, it does not work. <laughs> when you find the answer, let me know. No, j- joking. But what is he calling us to do? Or what is he calling us to keep doing? We need to reflect that in our own lives, in our own hearts, and see what that is, because there may be some disobedience within us. Verse 14 to 27 is the genealogy of Moses and Aaron, and it shows us the importance of why God chose to use them specifically. God wants the readers to know that they were perfect for the job. God had it planned that the exodus would take place. He had it planned that Joseph would bring his family to Egypt to dwell there and prosper under Joseph's hand. If you guys don't remember the story um, from last year, Joseph was a brother of 12, okay? So he was sold into slavery by his brothers, and basically the joke was on them because he ended up coming out on top in Egypt and basically ruled alongside the Pharaoh and ruled in Egypt and became like um, a prince in a way. Like he had very high authority in Egypt. So when the brothers had a famine and they needed to come back to, the, uh, to Egypt and try and find food and figure out a new way, leaving their home, they realized, oh, the brother that we told our dad that we killed, that we got rid of, we thought, well, now he's sitting here in the palace ruling Israel, uh, Egypt. So Joseph then, being who he was, uh, very Christ-like, he represented a lot of things that resembled Christ, he ended up bringing his family into Egypt and saying, come, live with us, eat with us, let me provide things for you. He gave those who rebuked him shelter, food, and he brought his family to Egypt to dwell there with him. And so the family of Joseph, it said in the, um, I don't know what chapter it is in now because I'm not thinking of it, I didn't write it down, but when we've read it in Exodus where it says now all those, it might have even been the first chapter, all of those lines, the 12 tribes have now passed away. They are gone. Hundreds of years have passed by. So now people don't even know Joseph. One Pharaoh knew him. He was like, yes, we're cool. Great. Bring your family. They're welcomed, invited. And now these Pharaohs coming down the line, well, it had been forgotten. No one kept talking about Joseph. No one remembered what God had done. And so now Joseph is long gone. Like this Pharaoh says, I don't know the God you're talking about. Well, back then, God had it planned that Joseph would bring his family to Egypt. It was not coincidental. It was not like, oh, by chance, you all just showed up here. No, the Lord knew this would happen. He knew that they would prosper under Joseph's hand. And so the most important part of the genealogy is Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Levi, Kohath, which is Levi's son, Amram, the son of Kohath, which is the father of Moses and Aaron. So you see all down the line, it was Abraham, and then it was Isaac, and then it was Jacob, and then Jacob's sons, which is including Joseph, Levi, and then Levi has a son, Kohath, and then Kohath uh, has a son, Amram, and now Amram is the father of Moses. Those things don't just coincidentally line up. That is God working his plan from the beginning. Verse uh, 16, we see Kohath, who is the father of Amram, who is the father of Moses. This line will become very important as we look at it closer later on in the book of Exodus. Let's pick up in verse 28, and it says, And it came to pass on the day the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt, that the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, I am the Lord. Speak to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I say to you. But Moses said before the Lord, Behold, I am of uncircumcised lips. How shall Pharaoh heed me? What's interesting is that Moses Moses is the author of this book, and yet he's totally confessing his faults. He's like, I can't do it, Lord. He's not like hiding it. He is confessing how inadequate he feels. Yet he's the spokesperson the Lord chooses to use. So tell me God doesn't like a good plot twist or using the underdog because Moses is like, I am not cut out for the job, Lord. It is not me. Chapter seven starts and it says, so the Lord said to Moses, see, I have made you as God to Pharaoh and Aaron, your brother, shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and Aaron, your brother, shall tell Pharaoh to send the children of Israel out of his land. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh will not heed you, so that I may lay my hand on Egypt and bring my armies out and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt. 
by great judgments. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. Verse 6. Then Moses and Aaron did so, just as the Lord commanded them, so they did. And Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 uh, years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. So now he's the spokesman for God. <laughs> God tells him, you will speak all the things that I tell you. Aaron will be like a prophet to him, and Aaron will speak uh, to Pharaoh that he should send the children out of Israel out of his hand. God himself was so unrelatable to Pharaoh. Pharaoh had no interest. The gods in the Egyptian times were all very tangible, something they could see or touch, feel. There were statues. They were deified humans, rivers, the sun, the sky. It was things that were very visible and tangible. Later, we will see how uh, we will see the signs God is going to perform through Moses that will be very visible and tangible. He will do it through Moses. It's going to elevate Moses like God to Pharaoh. He is going to see the signs and wonders from God through Pharaoh, or through Moses. I'm sorry. It's important that as believers we represent God in a clear and holy fashion. Obviously, this is not Moses doing it on his own, in his own power, with his own might. He has the almighty God in the back, moving Moses like a chess piece on a board. God tells Moses, you shall say all that I command you to say. He doesn't say add to it. He doesn't say loosely paraphrase what I just said and they'll get the point. He says all that I command. Now, we just talked about how we find comfort in Christ, but let's talk about the uncomfortability that that could bring. God doesn't say to only say what's easy. God says to say all that he commands. Our job is to simply just speak. Martin Luther said, only the word of God is entrusted to Moses, not the responsibility of making Pharaoh's heart soft or hard by preaching. The word is entrusted to him. This is God's will, and his word he is to proclaim, even though no one may want to listen to him. This is done for his consolation that he may be frightened not, may not be frightened if anybody wants to follow and obey him. If I could be moved by the fact that my words and sermons are despised, I suppose I would stop preaching. But God says, go on, Moses, preach. And this should be liberating. It's not about how many people you are speaking to. It's not about the size or the number of your church or your group. It doesn't matter if you have a speech impediment. The Lord will use you. Our job is just to preach the word of God. No matter our age, we see Moses was 80 and Aaron was 83, and their ministry was really just starting. While Moses may be walking with a comforted heart, Pharaoh is creating a callous heart towards Christ. Now, was Moses able to control Pharaoh's response? No. Are we able to control the, uh, are we able to control the response of others? No. God's word can do one of two things. Some hearts are softened by it, while others are hardened. Some believe the good news and they are saved, while others reject it. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, it says. Pharaoh makes a choice and hardens his heart. He makes it heavy and irresponsive. God will then come in and confirm Pharaoh's choice. God will strengthen the decision that Pharaoh already made all on his own. We are not robots. God did not make us to just do what he wanted because that would then be, it, would, it wouldn't show his glory. It would give no story. We would just do all the things we're supposed to do and there wouldn't be no glory to give back to the Lord. So God's sovereignty is now interacting with man's responsibility. He allows us to make the choices that we make. He then comes along and confirms the choices we have made. Eventually, God made Pharaoh a believer. Not in the sense that he repented of his sin, but he ultimately was forced to surrender to God's superior strength. God would deal with Egypt in a different way than he dealt with Israel. Israel was God's chosen people, and he made a covenant to love them, and he was going to rescue them from Egypt. God's mighty hand of salvation for the Israelites was the same mighty hand of judgment that he was going to do on the Egyptians. God vindicated his name by visiting Egypt with the plagues that we will see next week. God said in verse 5, the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. He would reveal his authority over the Egyptians with a mighty hand. 
Verses 8 to 13 is just the beginning of God's playbook. We see the miraculous rod in verse 8 to 13. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh speaks to you, saying, Show a miracle for yourselves, then you shall say to Aaron, Take your rod and cast it before Pharaoh, and let it become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh, and they did just so, just as the Lord commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. But Pharaoh, thinking he was almighty, also called his wise men in, his sorcerers, the magicians of Egypt. And they also did in like manner with their enchantments. For For every man threw down his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods, and Pharaoh's heart grew hard, and he did not heed them as the Lord had said. How did these false representatives or of false gods pull this off? Well, the key phrase here is the enchantments. So we must not think that it is beyond Satan's ability to bring counterfeit miracles. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians, Satan does all kinds of counterfeit signs and wonders. Jesus said in Matthew 24, counterfeits will arise, trying to deceive even the high elect. The enemy has certain abilities, but only up to certain limits that he can perform. But Aaron's rods swallowed up their rods, and Pharaoh's heart, the end of verse 13, grew hard, and he did not heed to them as the Lord had said. We started this chapter in a pretty dark moment. The crisis led to confusion, but the confusion led to Christ. Moses was reminded of who God was and the promises he made to his people. There was a time Pharaoh claimed he had no idea who the Lord was at all, but the time is coming when he will know the God of Israel. Not at his, as his savior, but as Lord over all. There will be people who take heed to God's word, and there will be people who reject God's word. As the times we live in get darker, and as the Lord's return gets closer, it will feel like the darkness is overpowering the light. But just like we see in these last verses, the Lord will have supreme power over all darkness. He will prove himself over all thrones and dominions. The Bible says in Philippians 2, 10 to 11, One day every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. It may be getting darker, but the dawn is coming. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for for your word. We thank you that it is alive and living, Lord, sharper than any two-edged sword. We thank you that it still speaks to us today. I ask that you would use this time as we go to group to um, just reflect, Lord, that we would um, sharpen each other, Lord, as we sit and as we have these moments of reflection, as we have maybe questions, maybe we need prayer for something. I pray that you would meet every woman, Lord, here, wherever they are, that you would fill them, that you would meet their need. I thank you for just your sovereignty, God. You, you establish our steps, Lord. You are sovereign over all. There is nothing that happens, Lord, without you knowing beforehand. We are so thankful that we can find rest and peace and comfort in your promises. I thank you that it has nothing to do with our fickle minds, Lord, or what we can and can't do on our own, but it has everything to do with you. I thank you that you have sent your son to come down and save us and redeem us, Lord. We are so lost without you. We were slaves to our own self, to our own sin. And you thought of us and you thought so so loving towards us, Lord, your loving kindness towards us. You sacrificed the ultimate, Lord, for our need on our behalf because you love us, Lord, simply because you love us, not because we are deserving. I pray that you would be with these ladies in their group time, that you would minister to their hearts and that you would continually remind us that the darkness is there, but the dawn is coming. In Jesus' name, amen.